it gives me very great pleasure to welcome you uh, to this, which is really the first event to commemorate, to celebrate 800 years of the Lord Mayor's Show. It's very specifically um, about a book that we've written on the Lord Mayor's Show. Um, and we've got two people with us tonight who were very, uh, very central to that whole process. When people decide they want to celebrate an event, an event, an occasion, an anniversary, they often come to me and they say, well, what we want to do is we want to create an event to do that. And clearly, with the Lord Mayor's Show, we've got an event. We've got an event with a fantastic heritage, with an unbroken tradition of 800 years. So what we've done in order to point up this monumental occasion, 800 continuous years of the Lord Mayor's Show, um, is to do a couple of simple, straightforward things. One of which is to produce a book. The first book on the history of the Lord Mayor's Show um, that's been been uh, published. Um, what's happened in recent years is that there's become a little bit more interest around the Lord Mayor's Show, a little bit more interest around the history of it, the, the audience has, has, has risen, and then a few years ago, um, completely un, in an unsuspected way, um, Tracy Hill wrote a fantastic book called Pageantry and Power. Um, and there it is. And that's the first... It was the first sort of real book on the subject. And what that's done is it started a, 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 little bit more of a, a little bit more interest, a little bit more academic research around the topic of the show. And I hope very much that the book that we've now created, which is much more general, much more accessible, is going to be an, a, a, another springboard. Now, the other thing that's happened this year, which I think is extremely exciting, is that the poster, the image, this image that's on the cover of the book, the image that you'll see on the underground stations, is a poster that's been created for us by Sir Peter Blake. Um, it's absolutely extraordinary, and the more you look at it and the more you dive into it, the richer it becomes. Um, and I think we're very, very lucky that that's, that's happened, that Sir Peter has, has dedicated himself to it. He's interested, as you all know, um, in all things British. He's very much a Londoner. He identifies very strongly with being a Londoner. Um, and if you look at his work, there is um, the processions are something that he is uh, interested in, and obviously this is really the procession to end all processions. So to have Peter um, do this um, is a fantastic thing. I'm going to show you a few images and talk to you a little bit about the culture and the cultural background of the show. I'm then going to give you a little bit more introduction to these fine people and then they're going to talk about their areas of special interest. And then I'm going to ask you for questions. So start thinking about your questions now so that when I ask, you've got one ready, uh, prepped and ready to go. Um, <clears throat> if you are... Uh, far-sighted enough already to be a subscriber to this fine book, then you're very welcome to collect your copy um, afterwards, and we will we'll do that. And if you want to buy a copy, and I thoroughly recommend that you buy at least one, because it's a jolly good Christmas present, um, then you can do that afterwards. So, um, that's me. I'm the pageant master of the Lord Mayor's Show. I've uh, been doing this job now for uh, very nearly 24 years. It'll be my 24th show in November. That makes me the uh, longest holder of that post um, in history and Tracy will come on a little bit later and probably tell you a bit about the background to the job and how it came about. What I'd quite like to do is just show you a couple of the sort of the significant key images that relate to the show. This is one of five paintings that Canaletto did. This one's in the collection at Yale. It's probably the most famous image of the Lord Mayor's show. It's a fantastic painting. It's a fantastic um, image in all sorts of ways. And if you start to dive into that, you can see quite a lot of interesting things going on. You can begin to see London as it was. You can look in the background, you can see Lambeth Palace. You can see the four spires there of St John Smith Square before it became lost behind the buildings on Millbank. You can see the Great Hall at Westminster and the Abbey behind it. And the Great <coughs> Hall, of course, was the destination uh, for the show when the Lord Mayor used to make his way to swear an oath of allegiance to the sovereign. In the middle of that, you've got the bridge, clearly. A bridge that, when the painting was painted, hadn't yet been completed. Um, and in the middle, you see two statues over the central arch, and they are the statues of Thames and Isis, and they were never actually put in place at all. So it's a good indication that if you want a good image of your event, much better to hire a Venetian painter than a photographer. <laughs> if, you look at the, if you look at the barges, um, there's a very obvious state barge in the front just here. Um, and there are a number of barges from a number of different livery companies. And the thing I just draw your attention to is actually the canopy of that barge, which is blue. If you look at paintings of 
um, processions on the river and so forth, you'll see that the canopies are often blue, they're sometimes red. And there's a very significant reason for that, which is that the canopies were interchangeable. Two different colours of material, that colour there called plunket, and the red colour called murray. And red indicates a royal event, and blue indicates a civic event. So we can tell that that's a Lord Mayor show for a number of reasons, not least the blue canopy on the boat. What I want to do in the conversation that we're going to have is just have a little tease out a conversation about where the Lord Mayor show sits as a sort of a cultural strand that runs through English history. And one of the interesting points, and this is where we're very fortunate to have Tracy, who's the expert on the subject, is the point at which the royal entries, the old royal entries, sort of went into abeyance and, and the, 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 all the, 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 the things that were created around that, all the, the props and the costumes and the scenery, all began to transfer over to the Lord Mayor Show, and the Lord Mayor Show became a dominant thing. So whilst you've got this ancient tradition of the Lord Mayor Show that goes back to 1215, there is a point in the early modern period where actually the Lord Mayor Show does become the key thing. And if you look at what we have, we have a procession with an unbroken tradition of 800 years, and yes, there are events, there are things that happen that have been going on for that long, you know, the enthronement of archbishops, coronations, and so forth, but there's nothing absolutely nothing that's happened as regularly as the Lord Mayor's show has, which is pretty nearly every year, although there have been exceptions. Um, there's nothing that's been going on for that. And, and there's this unbroken tradition. So if you look at processions that happen in continental Europe, most things were stopped by Napoleon or by somebody at some point and then were reinvigorated and brought back. So what you've got is this procession that trundles through London every November that absolutely has the patina of age on it. That's Hogarth's image of, of the Lord Mayor's show, um, and that's the Lord Mayor's show, the Lord Mayor trundling in, in, a, in a carriage. And you can see that it's a bit boisterous, it's a bit riotous. It's quite an interesting image. In the top right hand corner, you've got the Prince of Wales, um, Prince Frederick, and Princess Augusta watching the procession from the balcony. You've got the Lord Mayor with a rather grim looking sword bearer with his cap of maintenance on there. The cap of maintenance, there's a whole chapter on the cap of maintenance in the book. Um, you'll see some people uh, looking as if they're about to attack the coach. Those have been taken out by Peter Blake and included in his image. Um, but there are a couple of other significant points. That image is of the same show in the same year as that image. <laughs> that tells us a couple of things, doesn't it? It tells us that you know, Hogarth had a slightly different view of what London looked like to Canaletto. Um, Canaletto was clearly trying to make his case and, 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 and sort of present himself as a court painter, and that was the way he did that. And Hogarth was trying to give us a sort of a slightly more satirical view. The other thing that's interesting you'll notice is that there are two processions. There's a river procession and a, and a procession by land. And there is this view that the Lord Mayor always used to be on the river, and then it changed one day and almost, it was always on land, and that's not the case and it never has been. The Lord Mayor has always moved between those two things. So we know that the first river and the procession was in 1422, at least that's the first record we have of it. Um, but the Lord Mayor Show used to wind its way through the city, through the ward of the alderman who had been elected to office, and down to the river, and then there was a river procession. The last river procession being in 1860, when Basil Jett's Victoria Embankment was created, speed of the river increased, it was no longer able to row up and down, and, and of course the city became uh, lost their sort of sole conservatorship of the Thames. But those two images are interesting. Now my... Uh, proposition to you is that actually Peter Blake's image is the most significant British artistic image of the show since that in 1757. That's a Logsdale painting, it's a famous uh, painting of the Lord Mayor's show, it's in the Guildhall um, Art Gallery um, and it shows a Lord Mayor's show that is actually fairly familiar to us all. Um, it's raining, I'm afraid. It's not going to rain this year, but, uh, but there you go. You've got a magnificent coach. Behind it, you've got a, a squadron of household cavalry, uh, wrong, of, of light HAC light cavalry that were reconstituted in the 90s. The only bit that doesn't happen anymore are the beadles in their costumes. Those costumes, which were, as you see them there, until 1980, and I remember them, um, fell apart, and unfortunately the city decided not to... Uh, not to um, not to, to re remake them, which is a great pity. So now we have Doggett's coat and badge men leading the, the, the Lord Mayor's coach. But that really is, um, is, I think, a very interesting image. And again, there's a chapter in the book. Um, 
And, and what's rather magnificent about that is it's not somebody else's commentary on it. It's William Logsdale's commentary himself on how he made the painting, um, where he found the faces in the crowd and how it all came together. This is an image um, of Alfred Hitchcock making the film Sabotage in the 1930s. <clears throat> and um, the, the, the image, of the Lord Mayor Show is a, is, a, is, a, is a feature that runs through that, uh, through that film. It's the, it's the target of a, well, it's not the target of a terrorist attack, it's the thing that prevents the terrorist delivering his bomb to his target, and it's the Lord Mayor Show that stops him doing that. And that's clearly the Royal Courts of Justice in a field in Northolt uh, while the film is being, is being made. Um, and this, this is, a, is, a, is a bit of a close-up of some of the work that Peter's done um, and, and you, can see, you can see just there that little group that were attacking the carriage in the Hogarth image. And what he's done is he started in 1215 at the top there, really just putting forward some ideas about what the Lord Mesh Hogarth might have been like. Um, and then he sort of built on a whole variety of sort of slightly Celtic images. And he's come up with some really nice, some really nice juxtapositions of things. Not all of them obviously relate to the show accurately and historically, but I think it's a really very interesting take on it. I was very, very pleased that I managed to persuade Malcolm Bragg to write the introduction to the book, um, and, and I'm very pleased also that we've, we've had such a, 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 um, a first-class group of contributors to it. And what's fascinating to me, having studied the Lord Mayor Show in some depth for quite a long time, is that everybody's brought their own ideas and their own thought, thoughts to it. And, 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 and the, um, I think the, the, the proposition that, that, that Melvin makes that I like is that there is splendour and there's a knees up. It's the combination of quite formal, quite traditional ceremony and chaos and theatre and circles and a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of robust um, fun and games. Um, so that's... That's the, and, that, and that leads on, so that's the second, <clears throat> the second part, the lower part of that image. So what you've got is you've got the Lord Mayor's procession running its way across the page, backwards and forwards, through, um, through 800 years. And at the, I, I quite like the recurring image of the pig. I don't know uh, quite where he, why he, he focused on that quite as much as he did, but there's all sorts of stuff there that you'll be able to pick out um, and, and, and understand. So... What I'd like to do is really start the conversation with, 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 with Tracy and just begin to sort of tease out where the, when, when and how the change happened. How did, it, how did we move from, from the, the Royal Entry to the Lord Mayor's Show? And, and how do you think um, the, the Lord Mayor's Show acts as a, sort of a, as, a, as a continuous sort of strand to English history in the cultural sense? It's very much a matter of a combination of, of it, continuity, which you've been stressing, I think, really importantly, and also innovation. You know, there are differences through the course of, of time. The route has changed to an extent. The date has changed, which I still don't approve of. It's the 29th of October is when the Lord Mayor Show should be, not the 15th of October. Absolutely. Absolutely. Feast of St. Simon and St. Jude. That's right. Um, um, but in its essentials, it has, it has very much remained the same. And, and, and I'll talk you through a couple of images in a moment that will show you where the derivation of the pageant master role came from that Dominic has, has um, held with such, such great pride in the last 20-odd years. Um, I think as far as the actual kind of development of what we now think of as the show, it really came into vision in the 16th century primarily, partly because that's when you start getting books printed which contain speeches and accounts of the pageantry. Um, but it's very clear if you look at the livery company uh, records from earlier periods that there was always some procession, there was always something which is very recognisably an embryonic version of the show in its splendour. Um, what really seems to have galvanised the show in the, in the mid to late 16th century is the fortuitous juxtaposition with the, with the professional stage, the fact that the, the people who commissioned the show were able to draw on the talents of professional dramatists, basically. Men like Thomas Middleton, Thomas Hayward, Anthony Mundy, Thomas Decker, who's very dear to my heart, um, and a number of others. Um, and they brought their kind of professional theatrical sensibility um, and their ability to organise something like this, of this high degree of splendour at very short notice to the, bring, to the making of the show. Um, and I would argue, and other people may disagree with me, but I would argue that is the heyday of the show, really, the late 16th and early 17th centuries. Um, Samuel Pepys 
visited the show in the 1660s and, of course, talked about it in his diary, and he calls the show um, pageantry basically poor and silly and absurd, so he wasn't very <laughs> taken with it. Um, and it, it certainly was a bit of a falling off. I and mean, obviously the inaugural procession still took place, as Dominic says, almost entirely without a break for a period of two, 800 years, which is an extraordinary achievement. But its, it's profile, its prestige, its, its kind of visibility in London, I think, took a bit of a dive. And I think it was the period when Canaletto and Hogarth were dramatising it, it was starting to come back into, into yeah. the limelight a little yeah. bit more. It's interesting. I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think if, you look at, if you look at the popularity, there are, there are peaks and troughs of, of popularity. I mean, was that, I think, 1613 when it was... It, it was it had to be rerun on, on, on All Saints Day because it had been rained off. And, and there was a period where it, 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 was, it was actually scheduled for the day of um, Sir Walter Raleigh's execution yeah. because they thought that that would, that would deflect, you know, the, 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 the you know, pop, popular, uh, the unpopularity of it. And yes, so it, was an amazing, it was an amazingly powerful force, I think. And then, it was. And, of course, you have to remember in, this, in the period that, you know, that... I specialise in, that the, and, and for a long time before and after, the Lord Mayor was the most important commoner in the country. The Lord Mayor was, you know, was, was almost equivalent to the monarch, and, just, you know, so, and, and the city was economically and to an extent culturally and socially the centre of not just Lond the London area, but of the country. So it was a very, very significant moment, the handing over of this prestigious role from one individual to another, and it had to be marked accordingly, and, and it was. This is one of the images which has come down to us. This is actually, this is actually an early 19th century copy, um, but there is, amazingly, one of the original images from 1616 in the book, I should say. Um, this is from the 1616 show, which was printed in a book called Chrysana Leia, or the Triumphs of... Um, the, the, um, in this case, the Fishmongers Company commissioned the show. Their, their member, John Lehman, was the Lord Mayor that year. Um, and these images are amongst the few, and there's a couple of others I'll come to in a moment, which dramatise... Pic give us pictorial representation of what went on. Um, obviously, this is a static image, um, and there's a block, and there's no obvious means by which this, this amazing, probably wooden, carved animal was carried around the streets of London. It probably would have been carried, pulled by horses, um, with wheels hidden by kind of a curtain effect around the base of the, of the pageant wagon. Um, or possibly porters um, carried it as well, though apparently porters weren't as well behaved as horses. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful image, and these figures here are, you can see them throwing, in this case, coins out to the waiting crowds as they go through the streets. Um, and this is the uh, king and queen of the Indies in all their finery. It's actually the picture I use for the cover of the book, because it's, <laughs> it's, it's so striking, it's so lovely. Um, I'll move on to a couple of other images while I'm talking about images. This is... This is one of the most amazing manuscripts I think I've ever seen in my life. This is um, from 1629. And this was the year when Thomas Decker, the playwright, was involved in, in writing the speeches and designing, helping design the pageantry for the show of that year, which was um, a, an ironmonger's company in that particular year. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that the um, com livery company, the Lord Mayor, for that year was responsible for commissioning and paying for the, the show. The members were, anyway. Um, this is a manuscript from um, a traveller from the Low Countries called Abraham Booth, who was here as a member of the Dutch East India Company. And if you were in England in the autumn in this period, you had to go and see the show. It was on the itinerary. You, know, you wouldn't possibly dream of missing it. Um, and we have a number of incredibly interesting um, ambassadors' accounts, for instance, of the show right through the whole period. But this is one of the very rare eyewitness drawings. Um, what seems to have happened is that Booth was clearly a guest of the, uh, of the Ironmonger's Company, and had a copy of the printed book by his side because the, the transcript, this is obviously in Dutch, this is a very close paraphrase of the printed book. But it's the images, I think, that are particularly um, enthralling. There's the Ironmonger's ostrich. It's one of their um, ceremonial animals. And there is a photograph of this actual ostrich, which is still in Ironmonger's Hall, which is near, near the Barbican, um, in the book. So if you want to see a picture of that creature, which was carved by one of the Christmas family, who were one of the, kind of the, the best carvers in the early 17th century, it still survives to this day. Um, and this was a, a, an animal associated with the company. And what I particularly like about this image is you can just about see um, that it's actually drawn in pencil and then gone over in ink. So I'm pretty sure it's a very small book. It's about that big. It's like... What Booth would have done probably would have just done some quick sketches. He was a very good draftsman and then ties it up afterwards. So 
they're, they're very amazing kind of eyewitness accounts, not just verbal written accounts as the ambassadors produced, but actually you know, giving us a sense of what it looked like of the actual splendor of the pageantry. Um, and, and absolutely invaluable in that respect. Sorry, I'm trembling. You, 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 you mentioned briefly the Christmas family and, and, the, and the carving. I mean, there was, there, was, um, there was a division of responsibility between artificers and, and, yeah. and the city poet. Can you, can you talk a bit about how that... Try to go backwards. How do you go worked? backwards? Oh, okay, so we'll go back to the start again, sorry. I do this for a living, believe it, would you? <laughs> Gone the other way. Yeah. Oh, damn, I just killed it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, everybody. Um, yes, while we, while we turn the t appears. technical yeah. issue, thank you, pardon. Um, one of the images I'm just about to show you um, is actually a kind of a moment in time um, from 1613. Uh, which, fantastic, that's the one. That one. That one. That's a manuscript as well. That's, this is the, um, the grocer's company accounts from 1613, a rather beautiful object in its own right. What this does, um, it, it gives us an, a number of insights into the actual making of the show, what went on behind the scenes. And as Dominic just said, it was always a, a work of collaboration, and I'm sure it still is. Um, various people took on various roles. The really significant aspects of this, certainly for those who specialise in the early modern period, like myself, are the two first entries there. You've got a payment of £149, which is a lot of money to Anthony Mundy, who was a playwright and pamphleteer and translator, um, and also to Thomas Middleton. The next one down is Middleton. Um, and they are being paid for various responsibilities to do with the devising of the pageantry, um, subcontracting various activities, um, writing and printing the books, and so on. So they are acting in tandem as a kind of de facto pageant masters, and that's really where the kind of idea really has its genesis. Um, what is interesting about this particular page is that Monday gets by some distance a lot more money than Middleton does, but the printed book, um, which I've also got an image of, I've probably not touched the clicker ever again, um, has only Middleton's name on it. And I think what, what literary critics and cultural historians tend to do, unless you look at these kinds of archives which show you the behind the scenes dimension to the show, is um, understate the amount of collaboration that went on. Um, you know, they, that £149 that Monday got there would have involved liaising with, in this instance, John Norman, who was the artificer for that year, who would have done the hard graft. He would have been the man who marshalled the craftsmen to produce the, the pageant wagons, to paint banners, to um, all sorts of things like that. that. I think what Dominic mentioned earlier on, in fact, one of the opening remarks, actually, talking about the Canaletto pic picture and the colour of the, um, the barge coverings. That is that's a very significant element of the shows, which unfortunately, of course, the images that we've got, even nowadays, don't really show, is that colour is very, is very important. Colour means things in this period. As you say, red means, you know, royal, blue means the city, although in the other context, red means the city as well. And the company spent a lot of money on things like costuming poor men to accompany the procession and so on, to demonstrate the, um, the generosity and the benevolence of the company and the significance of the event itself as well. So there's, there, it's, it's a very multidimensional, very multifaceted kind of event, and I'm, I'm sure it still is. Having witnessed a, a, a modern show, I can see that, you know, there, again, there are a lot of resonances, a lot of ways in which there are common threads running through from, you know, 400, 500 years ago. Well, thank you very much. I, mean, I, I, think, I think it's interesting because, you know, we've, we've looked at um, some quite significant images, we've looked at some interesting writing, and, 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 and there are, you know, there are, there are many cultural threads going on. I, mean, I was particularly fascinated to, to, to hear that story about clothing poor men to, to go on the show. There's a nice anecdote from a few years ago. Um, Fidelity um, had a place in the show and they, they wanted to have people in pinstripe suits roller skating uh, <laughs> with bowler hats and stuff and they, they, their initial quote was to have everybody dressed in bespoke suits and they realised that after a while this was going to be quite expensive so they, they, went, for, they went for quite expensive off the peg suits. And... Um, and they went round, they went on their roller skates, they looked immaculate, they're all different sizes and shapes. And they came at the lunch break um, and, and they found themselves um, co-located with a group from St Mungo's. And St Mungo's is a charity, as you know, for the homeless and to get the homeless back into the workplace. And a conversation ensued over a bag of sandwiches that resulted in St Mungo's getting a vast wardrobe of different sizes and shapes of suits which these chaps could wear when they went to present themselves for, for, for job interviews, which I think was a rather sort of charming 
little, little, little thing. But, but what's come out of that conversation for me is, is, is a real discussion about the craft. I mean, for me, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a lot of influence and, and sort of higher level discussion involved with, with what I do. But actually, it's about the business of making it work. How do you make it work? How does it all come, come together? And, and that's where I want to, to bring Rob in. Because in the book, um, we've used um, Dove's type, which is a beautiful typeface. And Rob will, 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 will go into, into some detail about how it came about. But it's a very London story. It's a typeface that was lost and was reclaimed through his good offices um, and reconstituted. So everything, everything about everything that we do has that sort of, has that sort of authenticity and that, that, um, that rigour that runs right the way through it. That, I think, is important. I mean, it's, it, it, for me, it makes the book a mo more beautiful object. I trained as an architect. Go into any architectural bookshop. We love books as objects. These people read them. We don't. We just look at the pictures and put them on a <laughs> shelf. Um, but there is that sort of that, there is that quality, and I think that the, the authenticity of the show is really important because it has a dramatic impact in the way that it connects with the audience who come to see it, and how they how they sort of remain connected to it. So, so Rob, tell us the story of how you how you discovered that there was a Doves type to be fished out of the Thames. Well, I um, should we go on to the next slide? Let's do that. Anyway. I was uh, actually thinking of starting my own private press yeah. and I was sort of casting around for a typeface to use and I found some images of the Dove's press type not really knowing the story I didn't know that I went to I went to two very prestigious art colleges both of which were actually connected um, directly with the arts and crafts movement and people involved in the Dove's press or around that milieu I knew nothing about it, so anyway, I, I, I tried to find a digital version of this beautiful typeface that I'd seen in images of books, and there wasn't one. And every, most typefaces that have existed since European printing have now been digitised in some form or revived. This one hadn't. So I thought, how hard could it be? So I, st so I started... <laughs> Uh, attempting to revive the typeface, first of all from images that I'd found on the internet, they weren't high enough resolution, then I went to the British Library, then I gradually started collecting Dove's press ephemera, you know, as I got more and more into this project I realised that there was a bit more to it and at the same time the story began to reveal itself to me, so, and I vaguely remembered the story from college. But the, the, the myth of the Dove's press has actually overtaken its importance as a typeface. But I'll come to that if you want to flip to the next one. So that's Thomas James Cobden Sanderson, who was a friend of William Morris. Um, and he was a bookbinder. And he's the man who actually coined the term arts and crafts movement because he was the first secretary of the... Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society, he gave it its name, thus coining or naming the whole movement. He was a bookbinder, he worked for William Morris's Kelmscott Press, or he worked with Morris. They all lived very close to each other in Hammersmith. Um, and he decided, after William Morris had died, that he was going to start his own press. But he had very different ideas to William Morris. William Morris was a, a medievalist. William Morris was obsessed with the past. Cobden Sanderson was actually quite snarky about William Morris's obsession with the past. He said that men of today who affect the forms of other times have their eyes wholly or partially closed. And that was like a direct two fingers up at his friend William <laughs> Morris. He was also very scathing about Morris's socialism, because obviously Morris had two houses, one in the country that was to all intents and purposes, a manor house, etc., etc. He owned factories where he paid people piecework, all this kind of... He, he, but they remained friends, so Morris died. He wakes up one day in 1898 and he said, I must, before I die, uh, start a press, learn to print and decorate and create the book beautiful. This was, this was a, a lecture that he'd given to the arts and crafts movement. 
about how he'd do things differently to Morris. So if you go to the next slide. So along comes Emery Walker, who is a, a, a giant in British typography and printing. Walker had worked with William Morris, and Walker was also a friend of Cobden Sanderson's. Walker gave a very important lecture in 1888 about historical typefaces, encouraged by Cobden Sanderson. He, Cobden Sanderson encouraged his interest in historical types. So he gives this lecture, and the lecture actually inspires William Morris, who's done everything else, you know, he's created wallpaper, furniture, etc., all the stuff, you know, it inspires William Morris to start the Kelmscott Press. William Morris gets him in to help him design a typeface for the Kelmscott Press. I think if we go to the next one, no, it's not that one, I'm going to flick on a bit further, a bit further, a bit further. That one, and that's the golden type. This was this. this so Walker helped Morris devise this. But Morris, if you go to the next one, sorry, there's William Morris. Sorry, there's one after. This is one of William Morris's book, and here we have a little thread that goes through Venetian typefaces. So this is this is actually Rubeus um, from 1476. And this is from William Morris's private collection. So he wants to base his typeface on this, but Morris has got a slight problem. He doesn't like the Renaissance. <laughs> uh, he's, he's here, and this is a, a Renaissance typeface, but obviously before the Renaissance, everything was black letter. So if you go back to the next one, he says, I want to go back. Uh, the one before, that one. He says, oh, I, I, I want to... Um, rescue the black letter form from the charge of unreadableness. So basically what he does is he takes the Renaissance Venetian, which is just close enough to medieval typefaces, or in time anyway, and he bolts a few sort of black letter features on it, like these weird serifs here, with sort of pitch roof. So he fattens it all up. and just makes it look dark and slightly angry. And in the book Beautiful... In his lecture, um, not angry, sli slightly more aggressive, slightly more. Anyway, in his lecture, the first time he gives the lecture, and it's, it, it's, it's expunged from the rest, from the actual printed version of the lecture, Cobden Sanderson says, you know, the Kelmscott books, they're very sensual, almost too sensual, um, but the typography, I cannot get past the typography. The thing, uh, the, what, the thing intended to be conveyed will forever be intended to be conveyed and never will be. So he thinks that you can't see past all this darkness and obviously if you see a, if you see a Kelmscott book it's very highly decorated. So if you go backwards, this is his idea of decoration. There is no, there's no illustrative elements at all. Um, the only other elements are calligraphic, and the calligraphy is done by Edward Johnston. And Edward Johnston, you may or may not know, in 1916 designs the London Underground typeface. Um, so, there, meanwhile, sorry, I'm taking up too much time. Walker and Cobden Sanderson, Walker is now a partner with Cobden Sanderson. He refused the partnership with Morris, but he's, he's, he's helped him create this type. Uh, if you go back, one, two, okay, yeah. sorry, other way, other way, yeah. Next guy that pops up with this man, Edward Prince, who also cut the golden type, who cuts all the types for the private press movement. He's helped Cobden Sanderson Sarnison create this typeface. Cobden Sanderson's brought him in as, as partner, but by 1902, they're already falling out because Cobden Sanderson is quite ethereal, he's also very old, he doesn't care about money because his wife's got money and she's paying for the Dove's Press. Emery Walker is a working class bloke, his dad was a coach builder, um, he left school at 13 when his dad went blind, etc. He's a very hard-nosed businessman, also a socialist, they're all socialists, but don't let that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Emery Walker 
has hundreds of different commitments around Hammersmith, uh, around the arts and crafts movement, around various society. I mean, he just does so many different things. So he pops into the press for five minutes, make sure the pressmen are okay. Cobden Sanderson's got nothing else to do. He stays up all night and he's, he resents Emery Walker, even though Emery Walker technically has helped him set the whole thing up. So they start falling out. I'll fast forward to 1909. There's much wrangling about the fate of the type. Cobden Sanderson, this is Cobden Sanderson's idea. Emery Walker thinks he has a stake in it. Cobden Sanderson agrees, and this is after several other agreements and lots of toing and froing and lots of convoluted arguments, that his friend, Sidney Cockerell, has stepped in. I don't know if any of you have heard of Sidney Cockerell, who was kind of William Morris's private secretary. Um, also quite hard-nosed, but I won't go into that. Anyway, uh, steps in and says, OK, I'll tell you what, chaps, it's all calm down, because Emery Walker's taking out... Uh, he's, he's sent the lawyers in now. It's all calm down. Cobden Sanderson, you keep the type until you die, because you are the older man. That's not going to be very long, let's face it. And Emery Walker can have the type after you die. Emery Walker's already left the press. He's had nothing to do with it. Cobden Sanderson wants to, wants to dissolve the partnership. Emery Walker says, if the partnership's dissolved, I'll close the press down. And all Cobden Sanderson wants to do is keep printing. So anyway, he agrees to this. Fast forward to 1913. He'd already decided, by, by the way, when he'd agreed to this, that, he, that Walker wasn't getting the type. 1913, he throws the punches and the matrices away off Hammersmith Bridge, and punches and matrices are basically the masters for the type. Then he waits another three years, carries on printing. 1916, he throws a tonne of type off of Hammersmith Bridge. It takes him five months from August... 1916 to late January 1917, he goes virtually every night he can with a packet, with a couple of packets of type. He tried all different things. First, he had it in his pockets, and he would just, you know, great escape style, sort of, you know, wiggle, very surreptitiously wiggle his trick or whatever. And it, eventually, he got a great big box and he worked out a way of doing it that was kept him concealed. Anyway, threw a ton of type off of Hammersmith Bridge. And this became the myth um, that there's this lost typeface. Nobody could have it. Uh, but meanwhile, in its time, people like Stanley Morrison, who was head of, or typographic advisor at Monotype, which I think was around the corner in Fetter Lane. Um, people like A.W. Pollard, who was the keeper of the Queen's books, uh, sorry, keeper of books at the British Library, not the Queen's books, the books at the British Library. They all thought the Dove's type and the Dove's press was magnificent. This has all been lost over time. Of course, Johnston worked for the Dove's press. Eric Gill worked for Johnston at the Dove's press. Uh, it was fantastically influential in Germany. All the people that it was influential on in Germany were connected with what became the Bauhaus later on. So it's, and the thing about Coppin Sarneson's designs is they're very Spartan. And this was a complete break with the Victorian over-decorated style of design. So for me, it's a very important typeface that's kind of been forgotten. Uh, anyway, I went down there and I found it. Um, <laughs> there you are. Sorry, Michael. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> but not, not, not that much. Um, I'd heard stories over the years that people had tried to find it. Somebody dug up Cobden and Sanderson, somebody from the Museum of London, apparently, didn't believe what was in Cobden and Sanderson's journals. It's all there in his journals. This guy didn't believe it. If you know anything about Cobden and Sanderson, he is close to tears the whole time. The man cannot lie. He wears his heart on his sleeve. Everything that's in the journals is true. Uh, so they tried to, he went round to Cobden Sanderson's house trying to dig it, whatever. Loads of people have tried. It was exactly where he said it was, and I can't believe that nobody <laughs> looked before. Um, but yeah, I found 151 pieces, but the rest of it is actually buried under uh, uh, 
repairs to the bridge. Um, meanwhile, I'd already revived it uh, digitally, and I was just a bit worried about the spacing and stuff, and somebody had told me, well, then you can't, you can't really get it and properly unless you find the real thing. So I said, right, fine, and I went and found it. It was a lot easier than I thought it would be. And, of course, the port of London, I found, if you just go on, uh, you, I told you I wouldn't be able to stop once I started. No. Um, so that's the, this is the revival that I, I... This is how you do it digitally. These are my digital drawings. But there's things like, if you go back one, like the width of those side bearings. So this is the body of the type, and that's how it relates to the next letter. You know, and let, it be, unless you get the metal, you can't get it exactly, and I wanted to get it exactly. Um, and if you go on two... There it is. Those are the first three letters that I found. And that is literally ten minutes after I found it. My hands are filthy. Um, I, I'd got a mudlark's licence, gone down to the Thames, um, and just scrabbled around for 20 minutes and found three pieces. After that, I called the Port of London Authority, who'd already given me permission to go down by myself at low tide, and said, it's there. And they said, OK, because they said me, they thought I was mad, and they said, well, you know, <laughs> well, I want to find this stuff. And they said, OK, we'll come and have a look. So they, they brought up some boats from Dartford, and a boat from Dartford, and um, we found some more. But most of it was, is buried under a, a concrete that's been poured over the... Uh, it was actually poured over the um, pier of the bridge, down at the, uh, the skirt of the bridge, and it's gone onto the riverbed and just entombed the rest of it, we think. So there you go. Brilliant. Rob, thank you very much. That was fantastic. <laughs>
to go to swear an oath of allegiance to the sovereign. So the function was still fulfilled. And that goes back to a point that Tracy made much earlier, which was actually the way in which the, you know, the, the show continued, but not in, not in its most glamorous form. It was then reconstituted in 1946 or 7, I think, and there's a quite a good description of it, of, of it then coming back. The last time the Lord Mayor show was actually cancelled, cancelled and didn't happen at all, was in 1852, which was the period of mourning for the funeral of the Duke of Wellington. But in terms of the Civil War, I will hand over to Tracy, who it's will... It's kind please. of similar, apart from the enlistment aspect. Um, the, last, the last kind of show of, of, of the period um, that I've, I've worked on, 1639, um, which was just before the outbreak of the First Civil War, as you probably know, although there was, there was already lots of rumblings going up in Scotland and stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then there was still, obviously, there was always inauguration. The, the office didn't stop. You know, 1640, 1641, it carried on right through, although it got highly politicised, as you'd, as you'd expect. I mean, the Lord Mayor in 1641, I think, was impeached and put in the tower. It all got very kind of fraught. Um, but the pageantry came back, started to come back, actually a lot earlier than you might think, and it's part of this whole myth of, of the Puritans. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a nonsense, really. 1653 was the first year. We have a printed book, and the delivery company records clearly indicate that there was something resembling what was happening 10, 15 years previous to that. Um, so un under the Commonwealth period, it came back. What it didn't have, of course, was the oath to the sovereign, because there wasn't a sovereign. Um, all right. Um, but there was... There was still the handing over of the office from the one, you know, the one Lord Mayor to the next. That that is unbroken. And in and in good tr traditional sort of city way, you know, the Honourable Artillery Company, which is the you know the city's regiment, if you like, managed to fight on both sides during the Civil War. So you know they hedged their bets pretty nicely. Yeah, well, the, the big merchants did that too. I mean, in the 1630s, it all starts to get you know much more. Um, much more political. I mean, we don't have party politics in this period in the way that we do nowadays, lucky for them. Um, but there were certainly, you know, were camps emerging and, and, you know, things are getting very fraught. And the relationship between the city and the crown is getting very problematic under Charles. 1637, you've got ship money and all sorts of bad feeling and there's money going in one direction only towards the crown not coming back and, and those kinds of things. Um, but the, the big merchants... Borough was very tactical, you know, they, would, they wouldn't be too much on one side or the other, you know, they, they wanted to kind of keep their, their security and their position at the centre of the economy of the country, really. And leading on from that, the, on the restoration, when Charles II um, was restored to the monarchy, he decided that for his coronation procession, he was going to have his cavalry bands ride in gold state coats, um, which he then asked Parliament to pay for. Parliament were singularly dischuffed about that and the Lord Mayor paid for those coats so when you see the state band ride in their gold coats on Lord Mayor's Day they do that as a mark as a special um, uh, you know, a, a special relationship with the Lord Mayor that goes back 350 years and they only ride in gold coats for the Lord Mayor other than for the Sovereign so there are links at every, every possible level and of course in this fine book there's a chapter on both the First and Second World Wars <coughs> yes, over here. I hope you'll forgive me because this isn't really a question, but if you've enjoyed hearing about the Dove's Press, then can I ask you to put a date in your diary for 2017? because Emery Walker's house opens to the public. At the moment, it's closed because they've got a lottery grant to do some rest of much needed repairs. But in 2017, you can go back, you can visit it, you can see a lot of things connected with Morris, including a lock of his hair, but a great deal about Emery Walker, the man who was involved in the Dove's Press. And I believe that Rob is very kindly lending some of the type. I've donated so half of the type that I found to the Emery Walker Trust it's in, in perpetuity, permanent loan. It's in Hammersmith, it's on the river, 2017, and you can find Emery Walker on the internet. Thank you. Thank you, excellent, good. Has anybody else got any questions? Over there, yes. Uh, two questions, if I might. The first is, when would, was it that the Lord Mayor stopped making the oath to the Sovereign in person? And the second is how much involvement does the new Lord Mayor actually have in the preparation and organisation of the show? 1252, 
and quite a lot. Um, so, so the the, the, the Lord Mayor um, originally it was it was it was in, in person. I think actually that stopped before then. I think twelve fifty two, in seriousness, was the date at which they decided that that the the constable of the, of the tower could also take that oath. So it was the Barons of the Exchequer and the constable of the tower. Um, but you you don't find any any royal involvement. Um, you didn't find involvement from the sovereign after that point, so that's that, and that's quite interesting. So um, you, you do have other members of the royal family involved. You saw in the Hogarth image you had the Prince of Wales watching. Um, we had the Princess Royal participating in 1992. She's written the foreword in the book because she's got that position involved, but the Queen, um, not 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 so. Um, in terms of the involvement of the of the, of the upcoming Lord Mayor, um, it's a very personal thing, I think. Um, certainly when I first started doing what I'm doing, um, I was working on a handshake, gentleman's agreement, with an individual to put on an event for him, and that was very much the way, the way it was regarded. The way that the modern world um, regards risk and ownership has changed a lot of those relationships, but it's still very much a personal event, so the show reflects the man. There's a, there's a lot of structure around it. I mean, we know that there are going to be, you know, we know that there's a civic procession, we know that there's a lot of protocol, we know that we've got livery companies and city high officers and lord mayors and city marshals and you know, regiments and bands and, and, and there's a lot of that. But there's an awful lot of content there that's personal to the individual. Um, so they do help, um, and they absolutely help to shape that. And what one's trying to do is to create something that, that is evocative of the man. And the thing I find interesting, because I suppose I'm the mechanism through which he transmits his personality, is that, is that processions do take on the personality of the individual in a curious way. Um, so yes, no, they are very much, still very much involved. Dominic, can you tell us something about the uh, formation of your role as it exists today, how that came about, the sort of, like I say, the professionalisation of the role of the pageant master? Um, I can. I don't know how accurate it'll be. Um, I mean, I think, you know, you can go back and, and ask Tracy about where the roots are and where it comes from. I mean, my, I inherited the role from my father. One of the things that surprises me is that nobody's ever really given me a hard time about that. They always think it's rather charming, which is nice. Um, my father uh, was asked to look at the Lord Mayor's show because he was an architect and designer. He was one of a generation who'd cut their teeth on the Festival of Britain. He'd worked in 1951 with that whole crowd and, and was very much into all of that. He did an exhibition design for the city in 1971 called A City for the Whole Man, which was very well received. And the Lord Mayor's show was really going through one of the down, it was on a downslope, I think, at that point. It was very much, um, it, was, you know, it was in a pretty parlous state. So he was asked to look at it as a design project on a one-year basis. Um, 20 years later, um, having, having got heavily involved in, the, in, in a lot more of the, the sort of the the way that it's run, the, you know, the pageantry and the delivery, um, he, he died and I, I was asked to carry it on. So, I mean, I've always regarded it as a design job in its broadest sense. I mean, that's how, that's where my training comes from. I'm a, a slightly peculiar animal in that I was an army officer. I trained as an architect. There aren't many of those in my generation. There were more in my father's. Um, but I think that the thing that's interesting, and I do say that in the book, is that it is an interpretive role. I get to play at the top level in British ceremonial, but I don't have any rules. At least I don't, I'm, I, you need to know the rules, you need to know how to play by the rules, and then you need to know how to break them and to interpret them so that what you create is something that has legibility, that people understand and, and can adhere to. And the fact that you've got an enormous crowd I mean, last year's crowd was the biggest crowd we've ever seen. Um, this year, you know, I hope we'll have a, ha have a similar sort of size crowd. The very fact that we've achieved that means that we must be getting it right. Because people are very, very cute to, to sort of to distance. If you, if you create something that doesn't have structure and legibility, people will lose interest very quickly. And I think the thing about the Lord May Show is that it is chaotic. It is all sorts of things but actually we work very hard to make sure that it tells a story and it does it in a legible way, which goes right back yeah. to the tradition that, 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 that Tracy's talking it about. In the early does. I think, I mean, that's, that, I've never heard you describe the role like that, and I think you know, if, if Anthony Mundy and Thomas Middleton and Garrett Christmas were sitting here, I wish they were, they would be nodding vigorously. You know, that, that is the idea of, of 
a narrative in the loosest sense, so kind of in a series of episodic tableau that kind of have a kind of loose connection to each other, demonstrate certain qualities, certain aspects of the city, and particularly comment on the mayor. You know, I think the Lord Mayor in this, in my period, wasn't closely involved in the making. There was a kind of, you know, there was a pretense that they didn't know who it was going to be. Of course, they always knew who it was going to be, but technically, you weren't allowed to know until after the election. Um, about a month before the show took place. But the, the, sh the show would always comment on that individual. There would usually be some sort of rather feeble wordplay associated with the name of the Lord Mayor. So, for instance, if he was called Archer, there'd be an Archer in it. Um, 16, 16 one, the one with this, these images, his name was Lehman, and there's a lemon tree in it. So that, that kind of stuff. So there is a certain amount of tailoring, and it, that tends to get more pronounced as you get through the period, actually. Um, the, the, the people who did the work behind the scenes, like... The playwrights actually did a bit of research. You know, they knew about the person, they knew about his history, they knew about the, the, the trading companies he was involved in. So, for instance, if he was very high up in the Muscovy Company or the Russia Company, they'd have, you know, people wearing, wearing furs to comment on that, that connection. So, yeah, there's, there's mm. very strong continuity there again. Yeah, no, uh, yeah sorry. It's, it's, it, clearly, there's an enormous amount of preparation and planning that goes into a one day event. Yeah. But what's the sort of lead up time for you to start planning? Oh, well, the, lead, the lead up time for me is about, I mean, I'd say about 15 months. Um, and, um, and I think, I think, you know, I'm really delighted. I mean, I just absolutely love listening to Rob just now. And it, what it, it, you know, you could sit there and go, well, what's that got to do with the Lord Mayor Show? And it's got everything to do with the Lord Mayor Show because actually the Lord Mayor Show attacks everything at that level of detail. And if it didn't, it wouldn't be what it is. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's involving things in, 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 that, in that way, understanding exactly how each institution works and interrelates, getting the story, understanding the story, developing the way all the, those things work, putting those pieces together. That's why I find it intellectually stimulating. I mean, you know, it, you know what do I do? I organise a carnival once a year, for God's sake. What do I do the rest of the time? Well, actually, I think about you know, how we're going to develop it and how we're going to create it and how we're going to move it forward. And I think, I think that, you know, if we weren't being successful in that, it, would, it, you know, it wouldn't resonate the way it does with people. Um, I'm going to take one last question, then I'm going to ask um, Tim, Professor Tim Connell to, 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 to thank everybody and to sum up. But, but if we have one, one last question. While the Lord Mayor show isn't a state function, does the Earl Marshal have any input in an advisory role? No, not at all. No, I mean, it's a very separate thing. I mean, you know, the, I think one of the things that, that has come quite through quite, I mean, the city is an island. The city, the whole purpose of the Lord Mayor's show exists in order for the sovereign to get some sort of control back over the city, who otherwise would take over, do their own thing. I mean, they always do their own thing. The city, you know, why do we have our mayor making in November instead of in May, like everybody else? Because everybody also used to do it on the 29th of October, on the Feast of St. Simon and St. Jude, but everybody else decided to change, and the city decided that they wouldn't. So the city's always done it a bit differently. Um, so, no, there is no. There is no, no link there. Um, and that's, you know, saying earlier on that how I, how I sort of am privileged to have that interpretative role, it does allow me to do that. I mean, I do, I take advice from people occasionally, sure I do, but there's no, there is no formal function. I particularly, you know, I like to, um, you know, as one develops, as we are this year, we're going to grant all the, the privilege, the city privilege is going to be conferred upon 101 Regiment, um, or, uh, Explosive Ordnance Disposal Regiment, Royal Engineers, and, and we're developing, I'm developing at the moment, um, the ceremony for that. So I will consult with the Garrison Sergeant Major. I want to get the detail right because, you know, that's the great joy of what we do. We work with people who are absolute experts in their field and we make it totally authentic um, because that's what it's all about. So we're not, in a sense, we're not inventing, we are, we're actually creating, but, um, but no, there's no formal link. Thank you all very much for your, for your interest. I'd like to just um, wrap up by, by, by inviting Tim Connell to come and, and say thank you. But I'd particularly like to thank the team who worked on the book. I'd like to thank Hannah Bowen, who was a brilliant editor in bringing together a group of authors, and, and Neil Titman for, for putting up with me for, for the last nine months, which has been not easy. <laughs> and to Valerie, uh, Valerie from, 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 from Gresham College, who, who um, didn't put the phone down when I rang up and said about five and a half days ago, said, can we do an event? And she went, yes, of course you can. So, and even flew back from holiday to join us. So thank you very much to all of you for your support. Well.